Good morning, First Congregational Church. Thank you all for our time together last week and for inviting me back. I appreciate the emails, the, the texts, the Facebook likes and comments, and your prayers. Thank you to Reverend Leanne and this worship team who plan, who have planned and endlessly in preparation for this service today. First Congo, once again, thank you for your graciousness. It is great to be with you. At this time, as a social media moment, I invite you all to invite others into this space by sharing this worship service with your Facebook friends and family. Last Sunday, our text was John 4, 7 through 28. We looked at how Jesus dismantled gender, culture, and religious barriers while engaging with a Samaritan woman at the well, a moment that occurred because they both wanted a sip of water. Jesus claimed that he could provide living water, and the woman would never thirst again. If you recall, the Samaritan woman and others came to believe and follow Jesus. We also paid attention to how Jesus pointed out that God is not limited to a specific location or building, but God is worship in spirit and in truth. Last week, I left you with a couple of things. I reminded you that as God's people, we have been created in the image of God and, and created equally to be in community with each other. And I left you with the following questions. Who will you drink water with? Who will you give life to? What constructs of race and class are you willing to dismantle, including the disease and sin of racial injustices? Reminding us all that silence and inaction makes one complicit. Let us pray. Spirit of our most gracious and loving God, fall fresh on us. Living God, give us ears to hear. Give us minds and hearts to understand an inspired word. We pray in the name of Jesus, who is the Christ. Let all God's children say, Amen. Amen. Thank you to Kirsten Bailey for reading our scripture, Mark 7, 31 through 37. Let's turn our attention to the biblical text. Are there any healers in the land? During his life and ministry, Jesus spent a large portion of his time traveling and healing people of various ailments to transfer, transform their lives spiritually and physically. He did not only help and heal those who he identified spiritually and culturally with, Jesus also reached beyond the convenience and borders of gender, culture, class, and religious boundaries to help transform the lives of others. This passage is placed within a series of stories about the ministry of Jesus. Prior to the passage, Jesus interacts with a Syrophoenician woman. And prior to that, Jesus was in a Jewish community and had to do some traveling to get to this Gentile community. During his ministry, Jesus had a way of getting his steps in. Jesus traveled an indirect route, a twisted route from region of Tyre by the way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee to the region of 
Decapolis. When he arrived at his destination, the people of that place begged him to heal the man that was deaf. Jesus makes it a priority to go out of his way to help and heal those in need. It is important to point out in this story how Jesus does not have an issue getting close to those in need of his help and healing. I imagine Jesus understood the man's condition. Mark does not point out what caused the condition, but we can imagine how the man may have been discriminated against and marginalized as the results of his debilitating condition, all of which more than likely placed him at a lower socioeconomic status. This story is set in a period when those in community lied on oral communication. Therefore, his condition put him in a position to depend on others to get his needs met. Obviously, the man had people around him who cared for him. And as a result, they begged Jesus to heal him. Jesus makes an attempt to, to be discreet, but he can't get the crowd to follow his directions, not to tell anyone about the healing. Jesus gets close to the man. He lays hands on him and uses his saliva, all in an effort to heal the man. The writer of this text points out that Jesus looks towards heaven. In my sanctified imagination, it seems as if this was Jesus' way of seeking God's power and strength to perform the healing. Jesus does not approach the healing lightly. We see the demonstration of God's power manifested when Jesus makes the command, Ephrathah, be open. And the man's eyes were open. His tongue released immediately. Those around were amazed and moved by the healing Jesus performs and states, he has done everything well. Those around Jesus may have thought that the prophecies they heard from Isaiah were being fulfilled right before their eyes as they witnessed Jesus' healing power. The gospel writers certainly thought so. God's power in Jesus is not only over disease, but our hope is that God's power will be manifested in full over empire so that peace and unity will become a reality for the Gentile and Jewish community, for blacks, brown, yellow, white, her, him, they, them, it, all of God's children, and all of God's creation. Jesus makes it a priority to go out of his way to help heal and transform the lives of those in need. Do you ever wonder, other than the healings that medical professionals perform, what do modern day healing look like? During a recent bright borderland class trip, I had a life changing opportunity to meet the Reverend John Fice who is emeritus pastor of Southside Presbyterian Church in Tucson, Arizona. He was a human rights activist, co-founder of the Sanctuary Movement in the 1980s, co-founder of immigrant rights group No More Deaths, and in my estimation, a current day healer. In the 1980s, the Sanctuary Movement gave refuge and support to people coming from Central America who were fleeing U.S. supported death squads in El Salvador and Guatemala. 
Hundreds of churches were involved in the movement. During this borderland trip, I had the opportunity to witness healing taking place in basements of churches as parents prepared to further the migration toward seeking refuge while healers provided much needed hope and healing by way of food, shelter, medical support, childcare, and other forms of humanitarian aid. So conditions in the desert are severe. Those crossing the desert have to contend with severe heat and cold weather, with the violence of border patrol agents towards them and others who prey on those seeking refuge and much more. Though not everyone crosses the desert survives, many receive hope and healing along their journey towards refuge from humanitarian volunteers who provide healing in camps set up in the desert and from others who provide hope and healing from afar, leaving such basics as water, protein, medical supplies, and maps at strategic locations in the desert for those making the journey. Are there any healers in the land? Then there was the conversation I had with Reverend Fipes. He explained that the 1980s sanctuary movement modeled itself after the Underground Railroad. In February, I was reminded of that conversation while visiting the National Museum of African American Heritage and Culture in Washington, DC. I began my tour in the basement of the museum, seeing the various slavery and freedom exhibits that gave witness to the evil that was made manifest in people who thought it was good to enslave others and to the faith of the enslaved Africans and ultimately the black church tradition of freed African Americans. I laid eyes on the hymn book of Harriet Tubman and I was reminded of the healing and wholeness that this prophet abolitionist and political activist brought to many enslaved people she helped to liberate when she led them to freedom through the Underground Railroad. Tubman also served as an armed scout and spy for the Union Army in the American Civil War and an activist in the struggle for women's suffrage. In my sanctified imagination, I can imagine visiting a national monument of Harriet Tubman and also seeing her face on a $20 bill. But it's just my imagination running away with me again. Just as the healing work of Jesus dismantled a great deal, demanded a great deal of him, so too does the healing work of current day healers. There is a need for healers to be spiritually prepared for the work. Jesus often prayed and prepared himself by finding a deserted place to pray. The work of healing is not easy work as was demonstrated by people like Tupman Fife and Jesus himself. Tubman relied on the visions and dreams she had, and yes, singing the hymns in her hymnal. Fife explained that during the, our meeting that as soon as he arrived at the Southside Presbyterian Church, he immediately hired an African-American woman who could teach those in his congregation to sing gospel music. Fife explained it was the perfect liberating and celebratory music needed for the sanctuary movement. Being a healing agent is not easy, but somebody has to do it. Jesus makes it a priority to go out of his way to heal and transform the lives of those in need. I have met many current day healers 
like the Reverend William Barber, who is the leader of the Poor People's Campaign. Reverend Barber and the Poor People Campaign wage war with the forces in evil in an effort to bring healing by way of economic justice. Bishop Yvette Fonda, an ordained UCC minister and current day healer who founded TFAM, the, the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, an organization that provides a life of wholeness for many LGBTQIA plus folks around the world, particularly to those who have been pushed out of their families and faith communities into the margins of life. There are many more current day healers in our land who make efforts to provide wholeness and hope and healing by ensuring those in need have access to housing, education, drug and alcohol counseling, HIV and AIDS education and health care, pipeline to prison, domestic violence relief, food distribution programs, immigration support, and much, much more. In the midst of COVID-19 pandemic, medical personnel have been crying out for help along with the plea for the use of safety precautions to stop the spread of COVID-19. Since the modern day public lynching of George Floyd, our young people have been protesting and crying out in the streets, Black Lives Matter, and begging for healing in our land. This past week, Legislatures in Asheville, North Carolina has acted towards healing for its role in chattel slavery and racial injustices by approving reparations for African Americans in Asheville. There are healers in the land. In closing, this story of Jesus and the healing efforts of all I have mentioned, reminds me of Second Chronicles. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and forgive them of their sins and heal their land. I leave you with these questions. With God's power and strength in you, will you make it a priority to help heal and transform the lives of those in need? Are there any healers in the land?